Welcome to this educational activity in which Dr. Linda Rogers discusses the diagnosis and management of patients with eosinophilic asthma. The following audio is from a presentation with Dr. Linda Rogers. The audio is part of a certified educational activity titled Novel Insights in Eosinophilic Asthma, Integrating Appropriate Treatment Selection with Patient Education to Improve Outcomes. To access the entire activity and complete the post-test, please go online to www.peerviewpress.com forward slash WJA. A printable monograph, slides, practice aids, and other features are also available. Today I want to tell you about the journey of Steve, a patient in my care who was living with eosinophilic asthma. Steve is 57 years old and was employed as a custodian, but unfortunately had to stop working because of severe steroid-dependent asthma. His line of work required physical activity, and he would experience either dyspnea or wheezing after only a few minutes of doing his job. On top of that, he was exposed to a lot of substances such as smoke, fumes, and dust that could trigger his already severe asthma. In fact, I can't think of a worse possible job for someone in his circumstances. His asthma started two years ago, before he came to see me, and it was really uncontrolled when I met him. Before that, he was seeing both a pulmonologist and a primary care physician and had self-referred to see me to see if there was anything else that could be done for him. He had more than 10 emergency department visits since his diagnosis and had had six hospital admissions, which as you can imagine, caused enormous financial and emotional strain for Steve and for his wife, Donna, who's a nurse. They had been looking forward to retirement, but are now struggling to make ends meet. Donna had to pick up extra shifts and was overworked, exhausted, and had been experiencing anxiety about not being available to Steve if he had an asthma emergency. If Steve is not taking oral steroids, he typically ends up in the emergency department or hospitalized despite taking inhaled corticosteroids and long-acting bronchodilators. He also has a history of hypertension and diabetes, and as a result of chronic oral steroid use, not only were these issues not under control, but he had also gained a significant amount of weight. He requires albuterol by meter dose inhaler and nebulizer several times daily and is waking nightly needing beta agonists. He's also struggling with activities of daily living due to dyspnea and wheezing. He used to enjoy going for walks around the city with Donna. They enjoyed spending time together and he needed to get some exercise to help control his diabetes and hypertension, but he's now not able to do those things for some time now. Steve's asthma was substantially impacting his quality of life, but more importantly, he was in danger of dying from his disease. I really wanted to help him get his asthma under control. During our visit, Steve reported that he had no history of childhood allergies and that he'd never smoked. He also had chronic rhinocytositis that had developed in his late teens and early adulthood. When I examined Steve, I found edematous nasal turbinates but no anterior visible nasal polyps. He had diffuse inspiratory expiratory wheezes on his lung exam and spirometry showed severe obstruction with an FEV1 of 47% predicted and an FEV1 FEC ratio of 0.66 despite high dose inhaled steroids and long acting bronchodilators. His IgE was 177, but all specific allergens were negative. His complete blood count and differential showed an absolute eosinophil count of 800 cells per microliter and his chest X-ray was normal. So the question I ask you are, there are treatments that can help this patient remain off of steroids and achieve better control of his disease. It's come to be accepted that asthma is not a one-size-fits-all disease. Rather, it's a heterogeneous disease with multiple phenotypes. By improving the identification of specific asthma phenotypes, we can treat patients with more targeted therapies to improve asthma control and those who don't adequately respond to standard therapies. Phenotype-targeted therapies are particularly important for patients with severe refractory asthma. Although these patients account for less than 10% of all patients with asthma, they bear a disproportionate burden of morbidity and healthcare costs. One distinct asthma phenotype is eosinophilic asthma. The phenotype is characterized by elevated levels of eosinophils in either induced sputum, peripheral blood, bronchial washings, or biopsies, despite chronic and correct use of adequate doses of inhaled corticosteroids. Eosinophils are bone marrow-derived granulocytes that are a major inflammatory cell involved in the pathobiology of both childhood onset allergic asthma and certain types of adult onset non-allergic asthma. 
In childhood onset allergic asthma, Th2 cells are believed to drive the immune response. In response to allergens, viruses, mucosal injury, airway epithelial cells produce cytokines, including interleukin-25, interleukin-33, and thymic stromal lymphopoietin, or TSLP, which promote differentiation of Th2 cells, as well as activation of mast cells, macrophages, and type 2 innate lymphoid cells. Greater expression of Th2 cytokines, including interleukin-4, interleukin-5, and interleukin-13, is seen in allergen-challenged patients, along with downregulation of Th1 cytokines, such as interleukin-2 and interferon gamma. Interleukin-4 and interleukin-13 produced by Th2 and other cells results in eotaxin production, B-cell, IgE class switching, airway hyperresponsiveness, and mucus secretion. Interleukin-5 stimulates bone marrow eosinophil generation and mediates recruitment, activation, and survival of eosinophils. GMCSF produced by alveolar macrophages and eosinophils contributes to maturation and survival of eosinophils. Eosinophils release major basic protein, reactive oxygen species, and enzymes, as well as Th2 cytokines and inflammatory lipid mediators, including cystinoleukotrienes and prostaglandin D2. These products result in recruitment and activation of immune and structural cells. Furthermore, production of Th2 cytokines and growth factors such as TGF-beta contributes to features of airway remodeling in chronic asthma. However, the cytokine network associated with asthma is complex, and eosinophilia is not always associated with allergic inflammation or the atopic asthma phenotype. Adult-onset eosinophilic asthma frequently develops in the absence of allergen-dependent activation of Th2 lymphocytes. Evidence suggests that innate lymphoid cells, or ILCs, have a central role in driving this type of eosinophilic asthma. In addition, ILC2s have been shown to be essential for the persistence of asthma. ILCs can be activated in an allergen-independent manner by IL-25, IL-33, and TSLP. Like Th2 cells, activated ILCs produce high amounts of interleukin-5 and interleukin-13. Therefore, two different pathways driven by either allergen-specific Th2 cells or allergen-independent ILC2s may lead to production of interleukin-5, which induces eosinophilic airway inflammation. Apart from severe eosinophilic airway inflammation, the eosinophilic asthma phenotype is characterized by a variety of other features, as we see in Steve. These include adult onset, typically between ages 25 and 35, but it can present at even older ages, as we see with Steve. And although there is typically a female predominance, in adult asthma, eosinophilic asthma is equally distributed between males and females. Patients with late onset eosinophilic asthma are less likely to have an allergic phenotype compared with other adults with asthma. However, many of these patients, like Steve, do have elevated levels of total IgE, which may be linked to hidden superantigens against Staphylococcus aureus. Late onset eosinophilic asthma is often associated with sensitivity to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as aspirin. Another common feature of late onset eosinophilic asthma is chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis, with or without NSAID sensitivity, similar to what we observed with Steve. Late onset eosinophilic asthma is also associated with lower FEV1, an airflow limitation that is not fully reversible with bronchodilators. In addition, peripheral airways are more commonly involved in the inflammatory process with eosinophilic asthma, as shown by a lower forced vital capacity, slow vital capacity, and higher levels of alveolar nitric oxide than in other asthma phenotypes. Although Steve's presentation was fairly typical, some patients with this form of asthma can have atypical clinical presentations, such as more pronounced dyspnea on exertion instead of wheezing, which is related to dynamic hyperinflation caused by distal airway inflammation. Some of these patients may have relatively few symptoms despite active airway inflammation and discordance between minimal symptoms and significant lung function abnormalities. Eosinophilia is associated with worsening asthma severity, decreased lung function, increased exacerbation frequency, poor asthma control, and fatal or near-fatal asthma attacks. For some patients with this type of asthma, inhaled corticosteroids are not enough to control their condition, and some require oral corticosteroids for control, as we observed with Steve. It is therefore critical that we accurately identify patients with this type of asthma.
presentation of eosinophilic asthma can overlap with that of COPD, and it's critical to distinguish between these two diseases because the treatment of them are very different. A limited smoking history or an absent smoking history, such as with Steve, presence of rhinocytositis with or without nasal polyps, or a history of recurrent surgeries for nasal polyps can help point the diagnosis of eosinophilic asthma. A history of exacerbations frequently occurring after discontinuation of systemic corticosteroids is often a sign of corticosteroid dependency, also a common feature of eosinophilic asthma, and was what we saw with our patient Steve. Ideally, eosinophilic asthma is diagnosed by analysis of sputum samples, but sputum induction is not easy to perform in routine clinical practice, and it requires access to special laboratories with trained personnel. There are several biomarkers, including peripheral blood eosinophils, fraction exhaled nitric oxide, or pheno, and serum IgE, that have been explored as surrogates for sputum eosinophil counts. But studies have shown that these markers have only moderate accuracy. Periostin is also being investigated as a systemic biomarker in Th2 inflammation. One study demonstrated that fraction of exhaled nitric oxide and blood eosinophils were more accurate biomarkers than total IgE, and combining these two biomarkers into one model further improved diagnostic accuracy. Blood eosinophilia appears to be the most feasible surrogate for airway eosinophilia in patients with adult onset airway disease in routine practice, and that's what we used with Steve. Absolute eosinophil counts of less than 100 per microliters are associated with an absence of eosinophilic airway inflammation in 92% of patients, while absolute eosinophil counts of at least 400 per microliters correlated with sputum eosinophil counts of at least 3% in 95% of patients. With a blood eosinophil count of 800 per microliters, our patient Steve was highly likely to have airway eosinophilia. Asking patients if they have an impaired sense of smell, as I did with Steve, can be helpful in determining whether they have chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis and should be asked of all patients suspected of having eosinophilic asthma. Ideally, a patient with eosinophilic asthma should be referred to an ear, nose, and throat doctor soon after their diagnosis, particularly if their nasal symptoms become troublesome. Since nasal symptoms were not a predominant clinical feature for Steve, especially when he was taking steroids, he was not referred for an ENT evaluation. There are many other diseases that can present with peripheral blood eosinophilia and pulmonary involvement, and these should be included in a differential diagnosis. A thorough review of systems is important in patients with constitutional symptoms or B symptoms, symptoms of neuropathy, and any skin signs of vasculitis, as well as unexplained gastrointestinal or cardiac symptoms. Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, or ABPA, can present with poorly controlled asthma and eosinophilia. Imaging and serological evaluation should be performed in any patient with poorly controlled asthma. Eosinophilia can present in patients with tissue invasive parasites, hypersensitivity conditions, drug reactions, collagen vascular disease such as lupus and eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis or EGPA, which was previously known as Churg Strauss syndrome. EGPA, although rare, can present with asthma, nasal polyps, rhinosinusitis, and eosinophilia. Asthma is one of the cardinal features of EGPA, and asthma symptoms in eosinophilia may begin many years before the onset of vasculitis. Therefore, any patient with eosinophilic asthma should be monitored throughout their management for any signs of EGPA. Pulmonary conditions other than asthma can also present with eosinophilia, including acute or chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Certain hematologic diseases can present with peripheral eosinophilia, including lymphomas, for patients with very high eosinophil counts, 1,500 cells per microliter or more, and atypical presentations, particularly with evidence of extrapulmonary organ involvement, consultation with a hematologist and a rheumatologist may be appropriate. Imaging studies, nerve conduction studies, and tissue biopsies of lung, skin, nerve, or perhaps bone marrow biopsy may be needed to clarify the differential diagnosis. Getting back to Steve, his allergy test results were negative as I mentioned, and detailed assessments showed no signs of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, EGPA, or other hypereosinophilic syndromes. An evaluation for parasitic infection was also negative. All in all, his clinical presentation was very consistent with adult-onset non-allergic eosinophilic asthma. So our next step was to select a treatment for him. One option is omalizumab, or anti-IgE, a treatment that's been used for severe asthma not controlled by at least two maintenance therapies, but this treatment is indicated for patients with sensitization to a perennial allergen 
and serum total IgE levels and weight within certain ranges. In Steve's case, his asthma was non-allergic, so he was not a candidate for omelizumab. A number of treatments have been studied as steroids-bearing agents in steroid-dependent asthma, including methotrexate, azathioprine, and mycophenolate mofidil, but data supporting use of these agents is very limited. I was very happy to be able to tell Steve that we now have new treatment options specifically designed for his type of asthma. These treatments are monoclonal antibodies that directly target interleukin-5, which, as we discussed earlier, has an important role in the recruitment, activation, and survival of eosinophils. Two anti-IL-5 treatments, mepolizumab and rizlizumab, have been approved by the FDA as add-on treatments for patients who have severe asthma with an eosinophilic phenotype. Mepolizumab was approved in November 2015, and rizlizumab was approved in March 2016. Mepolizumab is administered subcutaneously by injection with a fixed dose of 100 milligrams once every four weeks. Reslizumab is administered at a dose of three milligrams per kilogram every four weeks intravenously. There is also an antibody known as benralizumab that targets the interleukin-5 receptor, which is a late stage development and may be available soon. Since many patients can be understandably apprehensive about trying new treatments, I sat down with Steve to tell him more about these agents. I told him that in phase three studies of patients who had inadequately controlled eosinophilic asthma like he did, these agents resulted in improvements in lung function, asthma control, and health-related quality of life, and reduced risk of exacerbations. I also informed Steve that anti-IL-5 treatment has been shown to reduce systemic corticosteroid burden in these patients. I also told Steve that adverse event profiles of the two approved anti-IL-5 agents are similar and include headache, injection site reactions, back pain, flushing, fatigue, and muscle pain from mepolizumab. Reslizumab is associated with oropharyngeal pain, and anaphylaxis has been observed in 0.3% of patients. Patients receiving reslizumab should be observed in a setting where healthcare professionals are available to treat adverse reactions. Considering the impact of eosinophilic asthma on Steve's life and weighing the risks and benefits of anti-L5 treatment, compared with the known severe adverse effects associated with frequent or chronic oral corticosteroid use, including infections, diabetes, cataracts, skin thinning, weight gain, and other metabolic effects, which he has already been experiencing, he opted to move forward with anti-IL-5 treatment. So Steve had non-allergic eosinophilic asthma, but what if he had allergic asthma with eosinophilia? In that case, omelizumab would have been another option. As I mentioned, serum IgE levels do not correlate well with tissue eosinophilia, but omalizumab has been effective in reducing airway and blood eosinophils and reducing exacerbations in children, adolescents, and adults with asthma. Should patients with allergic asthma with eosinophilia who are potentially candidates for both types of therapy be started on anti-IgE or anti-IL-5? At this time, there are no head-to-head -head studies comparing the safety or efficacy of these two treatments in this patient group. Factors that may influence a patient's decision include comfort with an agent which we have more experience with versus a newer drug, and the number and frequency of injections needed in a particular case. There are patients with uncontrolled allergic asthma who don't respond to anti-IgE therapy and show persistent eosinophilic inflammation, and anti-IL-5 therapies are an appropriate option for these patients. Moreover, patients out of range of dosing for omalizumab may be candidates for anti-IL-5 treatments as well. Patient education is a critical component of asthma management, so I sat down with Steve and talked to him in detail about the unique aspects of his disease. I also discussed the treatment plan, reinforcing the steps Steve would take in event of an exacerbation, and providing information on how to monitor his asthma control. I told Steve that if he visits the emergency department or is hospitalized, he needs to notify me as soon as possible. We also agreed to have regular follow-up appointments. I told Steve to try to keep a detailed record of any limitations in his activities, how many days a week he has symptoms, during the day or is woken at night due to asthma, and how many times he's needed to use his rescue inhaler. So how is Steve doing now? He's been on anti-IL-5 therapy for four months. His symptoms are largely controlled, and he rarely needs albuterol. He's almost been tapered off of steroids. He no longer requires steroids for asthma, but because of his protracted prior oral corticosteroid treatment, tapering has been slow to avoid symptomatic adrenal insufficiency. His glucose levels have improved, and he may be able to lower the dosage of some of his diabetes medications.
He's not had any hospitalizations or emergency room visits since starting therapy. And most importantly, much of the emotional strain has been lifted from him as well as from his wife, Donna. He's getting back to carrying out his usual activities of daily living, and he's even taken a few gentle walks with Donna. He feels ready to return to work. He's had a few interviews and hopes to get a job offer soon. He has focused on jobs that won't expose him to the things that may worsen his asthma. I continue to have regular follow-up visits with Steve to make sure his asthma stays under control. These anti-IL-5 agents have really been beneficial in improving the health and quality of life for patients with eosinophilic asthma, and treatment expectations for this patient population have now changed as a result. And with a variety of agents being studied for severe asthma, there are likely to be even more treatment options in the future. So in conclusion, eosinophilic asthma is associated with worsening asthma severity, decreased lung function, increased exacerbation frequency, inadequate asthma control, and poor quality of life. However, new treatment options can significantly improve outcomes for patients with this disease. Thank you very much for listening to me talk about Steve's journey. I'm glad I was able to share his story with you. I hope you found it interesting and that you can take what you've learned to help identify and care for your own patients with eosinophilic asthma. This activity has been jointly provided by ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening to this activity. To view the rest of the CME activity, download materials, and complete the post-test for instant credit, please go online to www.peerviewpress.com forward slash WJA. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Teva Pharmaceuticals.